Hi, I'm, my name is Jim Christensen. And um, today we're going to have grand rounds, the first one for the academic year for September 2017 for the UBC Department of Emergency Medicine. And uh, I'm taking a bit of a risk in giving the talk the way I'm going to give it to you. It's not a long talk, there'll be lots of time for questions. But I'm a little bit nervous about it because I've never quite given a talk like this before. <coughs> I normally give a talk with bullet points, so I kind of know where I am on the slides and everywhere I go. I sort of expand on the bullet points, and that's relatively comfortable. But I come from a place that's not really, uh, really comfortable for me, despite all the public speaking that I've done, to be a comfortable, relaxed public speaker. I'm going to tell you why, because we're all in sort of academic settings. When I was a second-year medical student, we had in one of our first clinical kind of seminar settings. We had about 12 students in this seminar group and it was on pharmacotherapeutics. And there was a teacher, a mentor, he was a hematologist. And what we did every week for six weeks, we had an hour and two of us would give a presentation on some pharmacologic class, therapeutics and class of agents. And we were pretty green at that time, didn't understand a lot about pharmacology. Not sure I understand more about it now. But, um, so I was about the fourth, the fourth week along, and this mentor had not been there for the past couple, and it was pretty high tech. We had an overhead projector, and we had acetates, and I had a marker, and we put down our bullet points on the marker, and I basically read the overheads. Now, it was pretty much the same style as what others had done, but I started giving this, my topic was ASA. And, uh, I got halfway through my presentation, and um, the mentor said, stop. I didn't know why. And he looked at me, and he said, that is the worst presentation I have ever heard. And I was pretty close to crying. <laughs> But I don't think I cried. And then he left. He didn't tell me why. He didn't tell me what I could do to improve. And all my classmates, my seminar mates, they gathered all around. They couldn't figure out what, what got into that guy today because it was just kind of the same style, same level as all of the other presentations so far. So I can tell you that it took me many, many years to be comfortable giving a talk. And I can tell you that it affected me as a teacher and made me a much more benign and friendly teacher and mentor. But so there's, you know, there's a good side to all those kinds of stories. So now I've got through all that doing that, getting used to giving talks with slides and doing that. Now I'm going to give a talk without any bullet points on slides. I'm not cutting the umbilical cord completely. I have little prompt cards here, so please forgive me for that. I, want to, I have to have these here so I don't tend to wander and waste your time. So I think you're a friendly crowd, and, uh, and I'm not so nervous that I'm going to be sort of paralyzed. But so I went through all of that stuff, and you don't want to hear all the story about me becoming an emergency physician. I've been And through all that time, I have felt very privileged to be an eMERGE doc. The thing that makes me reflect just about every shift is that we walk in to see a patient. We go to see them in the bed. We draw the curtain around us. And the patient immediately thinks, knows, has no doubt, this guy knows what he's doing. This girl or guy, know, they know what they're doing. And they trust that we're going to do the right thing for them and we're going to act in their best interest. And we don't actually have to prove ourselves to them. They instantly, they've never seen us before, they instantly trust us. It's an amazing responsibility when you think about it. It's an honor, and it is truly a privilege. Of course, there are other good things about being an emergency physician. I've already sort of fallen behind. So they trust us. There's other... Things that are of value to us, I think, as a, uh, being emergency docs. 
And what about when you're having conversations at cocktail parties? You ever had interesting conversations at cocktail parties? Normally you meet somebody there and one of the first things they do is they ask, well, what do you do? And um, if you proudly say, I'm an emergency medicine researcher, well, they kind of politely ask what your research is. And about the time when you get to a discussion of statistical significance, they wander away to refill their glass. Of course, you could say, I'm an academic emergency physician. And they glaze over, because <laughs> they don't know what that is. And they start to ask, and they think better of it, because they don't want to get into that conversation. And then they somehow have to go to the washroom, so they excuse themselves. But if you just say, I'm an emergency physician, they get intense, their pupils dilate. They say, wow, what is that like? What, what is that like? Tell me more. And you start to talk about what your job is like. And of course, they're interested in the critical case cases. And they really get interested and intense to tell you about their experience in the emergency department and what was the weirdest kind of thing that happened when they were there or the thing they didn't like or the thing that they really liked. But the crowd really starts to gather when they ask you, what are the interesting things? And you sort of intimate. And they realize that you're going to talk about the latest exotic foreign body that you extracted from some usually unmentionable orifice. And you are the hero of that cocktail party. What a great place to be. Anyway, I want to go beyond your notoriety at cocktail parties. And I want to talk about the innovative changes that we're embarking on with the emergency medicine, BC Emergency Medicine Network. I was asked by the last dean of medicine, the past dean of medicine, so Jim, what is a fundamental change that you are um, trying to do with the network? And I thought about that because I hadn't been asked that question before. But it's really quite simple, but I think profound. What we're doing is changing the way emergency practitioners share and communicate. It's about tearing down the silos that exist in all aspects of emergency care. Let me try to tell you why that's important. Emergency medicine is a team sport. You ever heard that? Yes? Yes? No? Man. What, is that? what does that really mean? It sounds great, doesn't it? I bought into that. Yeah, it works. It's a team sport. We do all these simulations with teams. We figure out how to do that. Does that ring really true? Is that something that is true in our practice, our personal practice, and in the provincial practice? I think the reality is that even in our own individual practice, emergency care is a relatively solitary business. The vast majority of patients, the doc goes in, sees the patient, takes a history, gets a physical, tries to figure out what's going on with the differential diagnosis, orders some tests, tries to figure out, come to some conclusion about that, orders whatever the remedy is, maybe gets the nurses to do that. But fundamentally, that eMERGE doc this is, this, is, this is not a real emerge doc, this is just um, a mock-up. <laughs> um, uh, that emerge doc really carries that responsibility and accountability in their own head. It's not shared. Of course, seriously ill patients, they benefit from us being there and getting educated hands and bodies around. And what a luxury it is to call for a trauma team, or call for the cath lab, or call for a GI guy with a scope. And then we really get into the team and the sharing and really sharing the responsibility and providing the best care. But for many sites in the province, the same patients that we need that team for arrive and there's one doc. And it's not much of a team sport at that point, even for the really critically ill patients. What about our system of care? What about if we look at the larger landscape do we really function as a team there? Do we think about the system of emergency care? Do we ever make it our obligation to contribute beyond our individual patient or a shift or a group? And does our whole community of practice around the problem share like we're at a big family dinner table? I don't think so. 
But so we got to thinking, why not? What's holding us back from doing that? So how do we make the vision of the Department of Emergency Medicine at UBC, which is really about improving care in the province? We do a lot of the academic things that you all know so well. But our real vision is to improve emergency care in the province. How do we make that a reality? Why don't we think about this as a big stage and think about our whole community as a team and facilitate the team dynamics that are necessary in the communications? Why not think of those 100 emergency departments in the province as being similar to a large, well-staffed emergency department with 120 emergency docs working at any one time. A unit where we can share information, learn together, talk amongst ourselves, and ultimately actually come to each other's help in the recess room, even if it's from a distance. So we started developing this concept, and we started sharing it with other organizations, the Ministry of Health, uh, the Faculty of Medicine, uh, the um, Rural Coordinating Center of uh, BC, and, um, and with our colleagues. And first there was kind of guarded support, what is it you're really trying to do? And gradually as we tried to explain ourselves, the support became more enthusiastic. Of course, some people thought, and maybe still think, that we were a little nutty, that we were crazy. Can't be done. Can't be done. Good luck. Notice the sarcasm. But we persisted. And we actually went on a discovery tour around the province with uh, Be the Change Group, who we contracted and are here today, to, um, to help us build the tool that we needed, the website that we needed. And um, we asked around the province, in large hospitals and small hospitals, if we, were really, if we really were crazy. What we, we wanted to make sure that we were meeting their needs. So we asked them, what can we do more, to more efficiently share resources and expertise. Why do we even need to do that? We all have iPhones, we all can search the internet, right? It's quite a bit better than it used to be when I first started practice with my little black book in my pocket and every time I went to a seminar or a course, I'd write little notes down and never looked at them again. But we still spend a lot of time searching for relevant information. And the interesting thing is when you think from a system perspective, People searching for relevant information is happening hundreds of times every day. Can't we make that more efficient? How do we link researchers who know how to answer questions with the 1,100 docs out there who have a million questions? Researchers don't have easy access to those departments out there. Maybe they can be part of a multi-center trial. And the clinicians out there in non-academic centers don't even know what kind of research is going on. It's very relevant research and clinically relevant. But they don't even know what it is, let alone how to contact somebody if they have a question and talk about, could we possibly investigate this and figure out a better way to do things? We have a lot of different simulation programs across the province. And how can we make them more efficient so they collaborate together? So we meet the needs of the docs that are across the province. And those needs are in rural centers and in academic centers. How do we even know what physicians out there need? Because we don't have an organization that allows us to actually check on those things. How do we expand the reach of simulation? How do we increase the number of courses? How do we fill in the gaps? And is there a way that we can evaluate simulation programs and other CPD offerings to make it much more efficient and effective? And can we develop a system so that when anybody out there needs to, they can call a friend? In rural settings, can we set it up so there's instant access? And our vision is instant access first, one number, to a well-trained, experienced emergency physician who we think can likely handle just by themselves 80% of the calls that come in. There are going to be cases where you need a pediatric intensivist, for instance, and we can easily figure that out quickly and get that other person on the line. So let's see if we can actually put that in place. So why not pull all of these programs together in one place instead of having all this little individual stuff? So let's think a little bit about the key premises on which the concept of this emergency medicine network is based. The first one I think about is that the same challenging patients arrive at every type of emergency department, large or small. That multiple trauma, hypotensive patient, decreased level of consciousness, signs of blunt head injury, doesn't just come to trauma centers or large community hospitals. 
That patient also arrives at 2 a.m. at a small little community emergency department with a fresh family practice graduate who's had maybe two months experience in a rotation in a big ED. That person has to provide the care almost by themselves, maybe one of their nurse, at the same time as while they're trying to arrange transport, because obviously that patient has to get into that community to get the best quality of care. And all these people just want to provide the best thing they can in their setting. And the patients want the best that they can. They understand that the resources are limited. They want the best possible care. Second premise, it's hard or maybe impossible to keep up to maintain current knowledge and skills in all aspects of emergency care. How many times, even in large centers, are you do we struggle with care for a condition that we rarely see or a procedure that we infrequently do? We need more practice in simulated settings in urban and rural EDs. And there's sometimes a need for, to put out that call to help get somebody to help us. And we need easy access to the kinds of things that can just remind us, OK, I sort of know about this, but I need a little reminder. How do we build that into the system so it's easy? We don't have to search all through a whole bunch of internet sites. Why don't we bring that all together? The third premise is that we do a lot of individual learning and searching, but we don't share those efforts. So I'm sure every one of you here has given a rounds, researched a topic, figured it out. It's excellent. You give it to 10 to 20 people, and that's it, right? Don't you think the other 1,100 people out there would really benefit from your knowledge? Fourth premise, wisdom is all around us. It comes from all types of settings and experiences. The corollary is that it's not the view of the big house. So the communications we talk about and the contributions are actually multi-directional, and we have to respect that. Rural general practitioners can find solutions that we wouldn't even think of, partly because they're used to working in resource-poor environments, but also they have, many of them have other skills. They do obstetrics. Some of them are amazing. They do cesarean sections. They have skills that we couldn't even think about having. So they bring those to the solutions that we might need. And sometimes it's just understanding the nature and the culture of that setting that actually brings the wisdom into the solution. As an interesting little aside, the rural doc says we start talking with them and we have a great relationship when we're sharing all this stuff with them and asking for their feedback. Um, but when we first started talking about the clinical resources, the two pagers that we could put together that said, this is kind of what you do, they told us that. They told us that they want something really simple that says, in this situation, what do I do and what do I don't do? and by, written by somebody who they would respect and has a particular interest in that. And we called them best practices. They weren't shy about saying, Jim or whoever else was on the phone, you guys don't know what best practices are. You can't tell us that. And I said, blah, 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 well, we can kind of tell you the basic premises, the things that need to be done. And they said, uh, you know, you don't understand the rural environment. The rural environment is very unique. In fact, you might be able to tell us some stuff, but we have to translate that into, into a way that's actually pretty akin to personalized medicine. We have to think about the patient and the patient's wants and needs, their family, the environment that they have, whether they want to leave the community, whether they can leave the community due to weather or not, and what resources we have that we might not even be able to do a lactate. Certainly Mike can't do a CT scan. So how do we actually put those in? So we've tried to provide something that works in that environment and yet still recognize that those are general principles and then they have to refine down to the individual patient. And the final premise is that university-based emergency physicians and researchers decide what to research. And we do wonderful research. It's, clin it's all clinically relevant or system relevant. But we don't really have a forum where clinicians from around the province can talk about their unanswered questions and maybe help to set some sort of um, priority in a research agenda. So we built this emergency medicine network to do only two things. We set the structure up so that we could support, better support clinical care at the patient level and with continuing professional development. And we built the system so there was the ability for emergency practitioners in BC to communicate frequently about what they consider is important stuff. And it could be anything. Each of you 
has the power to broadly improve emergency care, and I don't know how many people have thought about that before. So as I've talked about, just the, just the fact of sharing is so powerful. This network, we've got to this point, it will not work without you. But it will be incredibly strong with you. And simply sharing your knowledge and approaches to emergency care can elevate the quality of care across the whole province. So today, at the launch of the Emergency Medicine Network, I'm asking and hoping that many of you will contribute a little bit and encourage others, your colleagues, to also contribute a little bit. Share with the network when you search for a clinical resource and find a better one than what we have. Share with the network when you hunt for a course and find a good one that we don't have on the network. Share with the network when you investigate a clinical problem to be just be up to date or to give a talk. Share it. Think of the whole emergency medicine team across the province and think about how many others can benefit if we put it up on the network. So, as of yesterday, people started joining the network. This is the launch week. 141 now? 133. One, 133 now. And we're still, how many? 25? 25 more that we're vetting. You get to be a member of the network if, you, if you're a physician. Uh, WebEx and Becca. Okay. Tell people on the audio connection. Um, they can join via channel one, and I'll send up the link. So how do I tell them that? Uh, so I'll just tell them. Anyone joining on audio, uh, WebEx. Here, do it through the mic. Uh, WebEx is back up, and it's channel one. I'll send out the link to all faculty and residents right now. Thanks. So it's easy to become a member. Um, that's free. <laughs> we, when you become a member, and you have to be a physician licensed in BC seeing patients in the emergency department primarily to be a member here. And there's an important reason for that. We've been challenged on that. But there's an important reason, and that is that the docs when we went around the province said we will be much more forthcoming with our comments and our criticisms and our suggestions if we know who the audience is. It's not just wide open. If we know that there are colleagues that are there and we're having a closed kind of conversation, we're more likely to contribute and to, uh, and, and to share and have those conversations. So that's where we are right now. It could change in the future. But become a member and comment on what's there. Comment on how it can be made better. And comment on what's not there that should be there. Not asking for a huge commitment from any of you. Contribute a little and collectively we contribute a lot. Oh, by the way, if you do it in the next week, you go in a draw for a mini iPad. So don't just say, oh, yeah, I'll do that sometimes. Do it this week, and then you're logged in, and you might win an iPad mini. It's way better odds than 649. So this sort of thing can't be done in isolation. We have many, many organizations that I'm very grateful for that support the EM network. They have faith in what we're doing. They've provided encouragement and, in some cases, cash support to get us started. The real thanks goes to the individuals in our community who have contributed so much. And this isn't everybody. This is our advisory and management team. And these individuals have, have given a lot and brought us this far. They deserve the credit for where we are today and will support members like you as we go forward and engage to help make things even, facilitate things to make us better and better and better. So, back to the team sport concept. Is emergency medicine a team sport? Yes, it is. There are times when we are solitary looking at taking care of patients, and, um, but there are many times either with critically ill patients or in other ways that we act as, and we have to act as a team to provide the best care. But we've started thinking about the team from a provincial point of view. So we are a team sport at many, many levels. And let's build the team of provincial emergency medicine together. You are a member of the team. The team needs you. So spread that word to your colleagues who haven't been able to hear this today. We're just beginning. And my ask of you is that you come on board and take us all the way. Thanks very much for your attention. So we have tons of time. Let me do that in. Oh, not bad. 
We have tons of time for questions. I didn't get into I didn't get into all the details of exactly what we're doing. So, David. Oh, sorry. We'll just make sure that we've got the the mics on there. Yeah. Yeah. Audience mics are, audience mics are working there. Yeah. So, I'm just curious, Jim. How do you? Sorry. Sorry. Did, is the audience mic working there? Yes. Yes. Yeah, to be good. good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, how do you see the um, the real time clinical support element playing out if someone's in a remote community and they have a, a challenging question, a challenging case? How are they going to be able to get connected with real time physician to physician support? Right. So, one of as we went around the community, that was actually one of the things that um, that particularly rural, rural physicians glommed onto right away because they really need this right away. We're not ready to turn that on right now, so we're still figuring out the answers to some of those questions. There's a pilot project going on with Northern Health that we're part of in the Robson Valley. And so the Robson Valley has two hospitals about an hour and a half apart, uh, Valemont and McBride, and they can now each other. And they can, because there's only one doc on call, and he might be in Valemont or McBride, an hour and a half away from the other, so there's only seven docs in that whole valley. And uh, if they need help from Prince George, they can dial in. In, in Prince George, there is a, a video monitor as well. They can instantly get help from Prince George. And shortly after that started, so we're developing cases and trying to figure out the best technology, the best way that, that physicians can communicate. Um, and they had an, an interesting case right off the bat. It was a, a case of uh, a rapid atrial fib, sudden onset, quasi-stable. And um, the choices were for, would have been for the physician there who hadn't done a cardioversion in 10 or 12 years to actually bumble along and do it, or to ship the patient out of there was potentially unstable. But because this was in place, they called down to Prince George. It happened to be they were trying to get experience, so they called over an internist as well, and Patrick Rowe was up there working. And they walked by through uh, procedural sedation and, uh, and cardioversion. And the next day, the guy went fishing never left his community. So that's kind of the model that we'd like to put in place. We're talking already about you know, what would be the way that we can support physicians who are going to provide the, the receiving service. How do we do that? The EPOS service is a good example of a provincial one that does this for paramedics. And I'm told docs can access that too, but that's not very common. So we're going to be talking to them about what it means. The docs up there told us that if they were going to ask for help, they'd prefer to ask for it from their regional referral center so that they can cement the relationships and the referral relationships that they already have, rather than a provincial resource where they won't know who they're talking to and would never actually meet that guy. There was some sad um, revelations uh, as we went around that, and many, many times those docs would tell us that, Jim, when we develop that stuff, make sure the guy that answers the phone has an appreciation for our environment and is kind, helpful, and not condescending. And I said, what do you mean? They told me some horrific stories about the attitude that they got on the phone. Here's a couple of them. So can you help me with this case? The reply back is, why don't you open a textbook? Really? Or, I can't talk you through this. Just send the patient to me. I'll take care of them. So the soft kind of stuff is going to be really important as we put that in place. But ultimately, we want to have somebody that answers it right away. And our vision is that within our whole community, we have very well-trained people who deal with these things much more commonly and can help um, that emergency practitioner through that problem and connect with other resources if <coughs> necessary. And there's already some experience in, in, in other places as well that, that have been quite remarkable. There's even a John Polovich in Abbotsford actually Every day he goes video in video to five Aboriginal communities up north, and every month he actually goes there in person. And he goes to the nursing station. There's not even doctors there, and he sees patients and does that kind of stuff. So there's already this spotty stuff that's happening. They, um, what, we, what we think, we're a little biased, maybe a little arrogant, I don't know. But um, the rural docs say, well, how do we integrate all these things? We want a, um, a surgical upset. We want a network for critical care. We want a network for... Um, you know, renal failure, we want a network, we want all dermatology, we want all these networks. How do we, how do you integrate them, Jim? I don't know. So my answer is, 
and they seem to agree, the docs on the ground seem to agree, is that you know, when you're working in the emergency department and you need help, doesn't matter what the problem is, here's the one number that you call, and then we'll link you to other things if we can. And they might need other networks for other stuff when they're in the, you know, in the case room or whatever. Other questions? Andy. Thanks for that, Jim. I guess I'm, I'm trying to visualize this and you, possible barriers, but how, so let's say somebody up north would like to speak to somebody in Prince George because that person sort of understands their environment. That's who they would refer to. Um, and, you know, what if in the ED at that time it's a gong show in Prince George? And that, so that, that person who's on Prince George doesn't really have time for a 20-minute phone conversation or guiding somebody through something. And so, you know, then if you're talking, then, you know, the opposite model of that would be then for every region, do you sort of have a sort of a race ED person, you know, but that's a lot of different people and, and maybe expensive. I don't know. Or how had you thought about how you might do that so that you have somebody who's actually has a little bit of time, but also has that regional connectedness? Right, excellent question, and um, that, that has come up multiple times. So when they set it up in Prince George, um, and we're trying to work through those, those issues, just how does it really work? They set up in Prince George, they set up the receiving uh, monitor in the recess room, which you know we went up and looked at them and we saw some of the video about what they'd done and stuff, and we had a discussion about that, and maybe that's not the best place for it, right? And they, they had their, their primary acute guy answer the phone, and they're doing it right now just in a volunteer basis. So um, you're absolutely right. That would be a barrier. And, um, but maybe that, um, however we do that, but that receiving station needs to be somewhere else. Maybe it's in the fast track area. If, you're, if your department's big enough for that, it's a fast track doc that actually takes that call, right? And doesn't take away from some other critically ill patient. From the cost point of view, um, our thoughts are, are, are sort of leaning, I think, now towards um, developing a system, and we're starting to explore this, where it's a fee-for-service, regardless of whether you have a, an alternate payment plan for your department. And so um, the volume gets distributed if it's regional. And then, um, depending on the volume of calls, if there's a reasonable fee code for that, that just becomes your patient now. And if, it's, if they're acutely ill, the first thing you say, okay, well, this is the most, ser most seriously ill patient in my department. That's where I'm going to spend the time. If it's not that acute, you might say, look, I'll get back to you in a couple of minutes. I just have to take care of something and, and take care of it that way. If it's fee-for-service and you kind of can understand and predict what the volumes are, it might affect the staffing that you have in your department. Um, but it's got to be worthwhile or it's not going to be sustainable. And it has to be, to be feasible, there has to be the ability to break away. Maybe in some situations a group would decide that was going to take this on, that it would be like a TTL function or something like that. Dave, can you, can you put your mic, your mic on so others can hear you? Yeah. Are there any other provinces, states, or countries that have experimented with a model like this? And is there anything to draw on internationally? No. So you might think we're crazy. Why are we out there? There are other kind of aspects of this that people are doing. So in Alberta, there's an, uh, there's network, they call them networks, but they're not really ground up networks. They're networks where they're providing sort of more fulsome clinical practice guidelines for various things and then trying to get that information out to everybody in the province. I don't know, some of you are probably involved with developing clinical practice guidelines. Cost $75,000, you produce a 40 page document, nobody ever reads it not relevant to some settings, and it's out of date in a year. So we, the way we're going to do it is to do these um, two pagers. So they get it to everybody. We will have a link on every computer in every emergency department in the province. If we need to change it, the person who wrote it will monitor it. If there's new information that it needs to be changed, we can change it once centrally, and bingo, everybody in the province instantly has the updated version. So that part, and integrating the innovation piece the CPD piece and the real-time piece is, uh, is really what hasn't been done before. There's little spotty things with real-time kinds of stuff, but not in a sustainable way. Ontario has some networks. I listened to an, uh, an ICU network at a conference I was at last year, and um, it's out of Kitchener, or, sorry, out of Kingston. And um, the, one the one intensivist, he's also an immersed doc, intensivist that runs it, 
has five rural sites, and he's on call 24-7. Not really a sustainable system. So that's what we want to do. We want to pull this in so that it's going to be sustainable, and we want to coordinate all of these things with the focus on supporting the doc to provide better care. David. Um, thanks, Jim. Is there going to be any coordination um, with PTN, the Patient Transfer Network, so there's no overlap of, of you know, resources or, or, or of staffing? So, you know, for example, if in the rural area, through the emergency medicine network, they contact somebody in some other center for advice, but that the referral center is somewhere else if they're critically ill, then the eMERGE doc in the rural area has to sort of start from scratch again. Yes. Excellent question. Thanks. Um, so we started, um, they're, 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 the virtual network piece and development is uh, interesting. So the Provincial Health Services Authority has a virtual office where they're trying to figure out how to coordinate this kind of stuff for virtual medicine. The Ministry of Health has a, a group that's looking at that sort of stuff. Um, within PHSA, there's PTN that's part of BC Emergency Health Services. So we've actually started those conversations to figure out what is the best model and what is the most efficient way to do this. When we had a, we went up to a meeting early, I guess in the spring, we went up to Prince George for a rural, uh, rural medicine conference, and we talked about the stuff, and um, they kind of threw me back with their questions because um, they, first of all, said, um, well, the first thing they said was, why are you just restricting this to emergency departments that are attached to hospitals? What about the diagnostic and treatment centers out there that see the same patients? And what about the, the nursing outposts that see the same patients? And our answer was, all of the resources that we build are wide open. Anybody can access that stuff. So it's going to be helpful to everybody in those settings. But to be a member and have the discussions, you have to be, at this point, an emergency doc. Or somebody who's seeing, a number doc who's seeing emergency patients in the province. The labels kind of get a bit funny for some people. The next question they asked us, David, was, Jim, can you fix PTN? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, personally, no. <laughs> um, I did have a role before I had this, this academic position um, with BC Ambulance Services, the Vice President of Medical Programs. And there was a lot of changes going on, and we were trying to fix things at that time. There's still a lot of frustrations there. And what we want to do is to try to integrate that. So. Um, John Tallon, who was in charge of the communication centers, now is the Vice President of Medical Programs, so he has a strong history with that. So we'll be working closely with him to try to see um, what the best model is. For now, what our support is, that is going on in the background. Please make that efficient. Do whatever you have. We will focus on trying to make sure that the doc has the best kind of advice and help for the patient. And um, uh, in the end, if we can do anything at this point, it's we now have a forum for all those rural docs to be able to express their frustrations together and then be able to get those frustrations to PTN to hopefully respond to them. Yes, yes. Do you want, you want to say who you are? Because people... I was also going to ask about integrating with PTN in the, the existing services well, and the health people, Tell people who you are. Oh, sorry, my name is Emily Hamilton. I'm with the Office of Virtual Health at PHSA. Um, and I was just going to ask about um, the real-time support and how it would be integrated with, with existing systems. But um, you've already touched that. Um, what about the timeline for implementing the real-time support? When do you think that might happen? So we've kind of given ourselves a two-year window okay. to figure it out and to really understand the cases and the lessons that we'll learn from the Robson Valley. There's a okay. lot of pressure now to yeah. start other little pilots where we can learn more. And there's lots to be learned. Um, in this Kingston model that um, I mentioned to you, it was quite, quite remarkable. It didn't seem like it was sustainable. But they felt it was quite appropriate just to have like a little round, you know, those little hemispheric security cameras directly above the resuscitation bed. That's all they needed for a camera. And they had a way to link into that so that the, the, the doctor that was trying to help out can actually see the patient from a bird's eye view and talk to the emergency physician. Whereas the Robson Valley are these big carts, and they can see a lot more stuff. They can see lab results, they can see x-rays, they can see a bunch of other stuff. But um, so there's, there's different ways to figure that out. And then the other issues we've talked about, we have to kind of figure out how do we integrate it and, and who, it, who it is and how do we make sure that's a, a warm, kind response. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah. Well, I think it just must be challenging for you because probably it sounds like when you start talking about one one thing, providing emergency care to emergency departments, people just want you to do more and more and more and more. So how how will you um, manage the scope? <laughs> well, we've we've pretty much defined what it is yeah. in those four programs. Yeah. And they're all going at different speeds. We have enough um, content there now as of this week. Thank God people have been working really hard for the past three or four months that I think it looks okay, but it's still lots of holes in it. So that's why we need everybody to sort of bring it on. So it's going to be developing. It's going to be getting better and better forever, right. hopefully. Yeah. Right. And so, um, but we have started talking about some of the scope, scope creep, creep. And so we're going to talk about doing perhaps another discovery tour with Aboriginal community. And try to bring them in, try to figure out what they need and what it might be take to help that help them. So we might start that. And we've just added the diagnostic and treatment centers. They said, okay, no brainer, just add those to the group. Um, and um, and from the CPD perspective and the innovation perspective, we already have strong programs, and we're just working towards getting people more and more involved and try to meet the needs of people um, gradually and understanding those. So um, lots and lots to do. We can't do everything. You're right. We resist scope creep, but there's a good argument for scope creep, too. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Eric. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, so along the lines of scope creep, you know, emergency medicine sits in the middle, right? It's, it's, not, an in, it's not inpatient, and it's not community. It's kind of in the middle. And so some of the, some of the challenges that we face are connecting people. Two places, and so um, any any thoughts about working with family practice or other community agencies to kind of I, I don't want to say extend the reach, but you know our, some of our biggest challenges in, in in urban centers are to get people to a doctor. They don't have a doctor. That's not an issue in community. And is there thoughts that maybe some of the family doctors who work in rural communities might reciprocate and do some kind of virtual care for some of our patients that don't have? Physicians are, are, are a way for our for patients to hook up with family practice, I guess. Well, that's a big challenge. Um, we're not going to take that on right now. I don't know how the network right now, we'd have to decide exactly what it is we'd be trying to do and how the network can maybe facilitate it. Um, but I think that's beyond. I think that's more local issues. And however... In the smaller communities, there are many communities where virtually all of the general practitioners there work and emerge. So they're going to have access to this, and they can start talking in the fora about and sharing solutions across communities, across health authorities, and figure out what they're doing. So I think we can provide a platform where that conversation can be a little richer. Um, but I don't think we take on that problem face on. So one of the reasons, there's something called the Academic Health Sciences uh, Network that's a big thing with the ministry and the faculty of medicine. And right now, we are the poster child for the clinical network there. We are so much further out in front than any other clinical network at this point, we are told. And um, one of the reasons that we've been able to do that, and they're still kind of struggling, navel-gazing a little bit about what it is they're trying to do. And at, at the very base, maybe it's just an amalgamation of a bunch of clinical networks. I don't know. Um, but... One of the things that's made it uh, pretty easy to get buy-in and is to have the focus that we are talking about a patient in the emergency department and supporting the doc to provide that care. We think there's huge system benefits. We think there are patients that don't have, won't have to be transferred because we provide that support. We think the patient outcomes will be better because we're providing the support to be able to, for the doctor to be able to, to give uh, better care. So we want to stay focused on that and not, not, not lose um, try to try to put our. We only have so much energy, and even to do that is, is challenging. So we're not going to expand beyond. But keep challenging me. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so if we want to share information on this network, is there any guidelines for what we can share? Whether it has to be peer reviewed, what kind of level of evidence, or is this just going to kind of turn into a free, open access, opinionated medicine type of a feed for people to look at? Yeah, no, we'll be, we'll be coordinating it. You can't just go into the network and put something up on it. So we have central administration, and we have people that actually can talk to you about how we want to do it. We want to have a common look and feel, for instance, to the clinical resources. Um, or that, uh, Julian, help me. 
<laughs> so we call them, yeah, point of care clinical summaries. So we want to have the, the same format to that. We want it to, to be some delivered by somebody who has a special interest, not somebody who necessarily um, just decided to um, look up some stuff and then put it on there. Um, but we want people to actually do that and to contact us, and we can put you in touch with somebody, other people, and we can build that resource together because it might be a resource that we really want to have. But then it'll go up in there in a much more coordinated way. Every single resource that's on the network has the opportunity for, med for members to comment. So if you put it up there as an author, you have to be ready to field those comments when people say, hey, this doesn't work in my setting. What the hell are you talking about? So well, why is that? Well, because blah, blah, blah. Oh, I get it. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Let's work with that and let's change it. So it's a very dynamic process. And, um, but there are lots of things that you might be able to just um, contact us and say, like we have, I don't know, hundreds of patient discharge summaries in many, many languages that are up there now. So you can go there, find it, you know, and, and so we work together. We know individual departments or regions have been doing that for years, right? So we tried to find the best ones and put them there. So if you find a better one, and you just want to say, hey, this would be good. You know, why don't you put it there? We'll just say, great, thanks very much. We'll, we'll put it up on the website for you. Other questions? Are you converts? Now, if this was a religious thing, I could pass the hat. We could, we could make lots of money. Anyway, Riyadh. Just, just wanted to make a, a comment, sort of following up on the question of whether other jurisdictions have done this. And, and um, it was interesting at Research Day, this past year when Paul Atkinson was here from Nova Scotia. And his, uh, his question to us when he heard about this was, wow, can we join? Like, is there a way for us to get in on this? So, you know, it's, it's interesting when you think about that because this may well be the, the leading edge of something that we see in other provinces as well. And, you know, the potential of interdigitating networks like this is there. And so I think there's a... You know, we talk about scope creep. It's I guess I guess we're going to define where this goes, and the yeah. sky's the limit a little bit. And, and yeah. questions like what Eric asks are, are a good example of that. And um, I, you know, I just I think it's a really exciting thing, and it's yeah. uh, it's interesting when when other people hear about it, the, like Paul did. He immediately seemed to think, "Wow, this is a great thing. Like it's very logical. It makes sense. Can we get in on this?" And our answer to him was the same as what you said with the diagnostic treatment centers, that, hey, this is public access right now. You can get in on it, and you can access this stuff. But in terms of the discussions, the forums, that right now is focused on BC. So Nova Scotia has asked us for lots of information. So they're trying to figure out kind of how to do that. And we've had multiple conversations with them, as well as not just with Paul, but Dave Petrie, who's in charge of now the Provincial Emergency Medicine Network office. And um, yeah, so that, that validates, I think, what we're doing. And same thing, um, a friend of mine runs five emergency departments in the Whitby, Oshawa area, 200,000 patients um, a year. And um, he came to the, we did a little Kate presentation, and he came to that and said, oh my God, I was trying to figure out how to do this. Can we just use your stuff? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So again, it was obviously nothing exists there in Ontario for them to do this kind of stuff. So um, we said, yeah, go ahead. Todd, sorry, did you have a question too? It's gone. Um, but I did want to mention, so there's other people besides who I showed that have been involved. Todd is one of them. One of the things that we have up there for these point of care summaries that we didn't actually talk about is we've tried to find the best little procedural videos. And how many do we have up there now that we've, we're quite comfortable with? We have 25 of them up there now. We'll keep building that portfolio. And Todd has spent a lot of time and, uh, and helping us find the, the right ones. So that's the kind of thing you say, well, yeah, I learned at one point how to tap an ankle, but I haven't done it for three years. Um, so bingo, go to the network, pull up procedural video, how to tap an ankle. So two and a half minutes, three minutes, got it. Okay, back to the patient. That's an example. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Quick. I will say on that is that <clears throat> if you find stuff, because I you know, spent a fair bit of time looking for the different resources that are available and stuff, um, <clears throat> and you find a video that's better, or you look at it and go, that makes no sense to me, and you make your own, let us know as well. Because yeah. we can we can post that stuff. We'd much rather have, there's some stuff that's up there, there's some bits that, that niches and little individual sub-procedures that we haven't put up there because there aren't any ones that are good out there that I've been able to find in literally yeah. hundreds of hours of looking. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so if, 
if you know, especially the learners are interested or you see something, get get a patient's permission. Make sure you because there are forms at pretty much every site for <laughs> video and photo release and consent. <clears throat> and you want to video it and make something. That's what this is. The other point of all this is if you see a summary that you, you, you would wish was there and you want to create it, then create it or ask we'll, for we'll help. help. Yeah, we'll or help ask for create. help about how to do it. <clears throat> and we'll point you in the right direction on how to put stuff up so we can get more yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Todd. Yeah, so Kelowna has put up one on shoulder dislocation. And um, actually, when we were talking to, there's a, we, when we're in Port Alberni, there's uh, a couple of people there that actually make their own video. So we're going to talk to them about sharing them. We might get cut off. Julian, last final comment. I just wanted to say, I hope it's a, I think people can appreciate how novel this is and how innovative this is and how much learning is going to happen. So it really takes everybody to contribute to this. The actual final thing I wanted to say was to congratulate you, Jim, because you clearly are leading this. Your conference is now over. Goodbye. Never get this far. Bye, so. everybody. That's what I wanted to say. Very, very, very kind, Julian, but if